It is not. A couple more. A couple more. Very good. Because I was interested in your next round. It's going to be with that book by Jay Bird. I'm looking forward to that also. Okay, let's start with prayer, please. Dear Lord Jesus, we come to you with all the blessings that you shower upon us each, each day and each week. And we thank you for that. We're not worthy of that. But you, by your grace, continue to bless us as the Father blesses his children. Um, and we're blessed through this series of lessons that we're going through on heaven and hell and the final things. Pastor is plowing open the, the, the soil of our hearts and dropping in the seeds of your words to grow. And we praise you for that and thank him for that. Um, that these words, these truths, show us the joys of eternal, eternal life with you in heaven and help us to show that in our lives and words as we speak to others about your greatness and your love toward us. Be with us through this week. Grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, nice crowd this morning. Do we have any announcements? Anybody this week, summer weeks? I know BBS coming up. It looks like a train's about ready to run into pasture there on the wall. That's cool. Um, don't forget uh, the collection over there for the breakfast treats is going to uh, Ethan Hart. I think I said last week. His dad, Rod Hart, <laughs> but it's Ethan, and don't forget the seminary in India, and also the Pennies for Life collection up here is always available for your uh, offerings. And Pastor, please. All right. Thank you, Don. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here, and uh, good to have you joining us online if you're there. Um, the uh, Bible class sheet is always available on the website, and uh, you can always take a look at that uh, prior to class time. It's usually up there Thursday, Friday, somewhere in there, so good to have you with us there. Um, so let me begin by saying this. Uh, today we're going to talk about what heaven is going to be like, uh, based on what scripture tells us. So let me say this as lovingly and gently as I can, right? It doesn't matter what you think. Can I, can I just say that as a loving pastor? I, I've, I've had people push back to me when I'm like, well, this is what the Bible says. Yeah, I don't like that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right? So today we're going to end with something uh, that is going to be very unsettling for us uh, at the end of our lesson today. And you're going to come up to me afterwards. You're going to go, Pastor, I don't like that. Right? To which I will say, take it up with him when you get there. Right? Because see, what we have to do is we have to really fight against slipping into, well, this is what I want. This is what I would prefer. That's when we get in trouble. Right? Instead of just taking the word as it is and says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And, uh, and I, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but, but when people come up to me and we talk about these things, they're like, yeah, Pastor, uh, you said this about heaven or hell. Yeah, I don't like that. As, as if you're not going to believe it or trust it or whatever. They're like, it, that's not really up for debate, right? We're just reporting, in a sense, what the Word of God tells us. And uh, so, so we're going to be doing a lot of uh, uh, scripture reading today, a lot of uh, references. So um, it would be helpful if you would kind of work ahead and uh, have the next one ready as we go through this and, uh, and take a look. So we're going to take a look at this uh, picture of eternal life. That, uh, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on paradise, heaven. 
And we're going to talk about what heaven means all the time or, or some of the time and so forth as we go through this. So if you would open up your Bibles to uh, Revelation 21, and there's actually, uh, that is one of the great chapters. We're not going to read the whole thing today. We don't really have the time to, but there is a tremendous amount of information in Revelation 21 of a picture of paradise. God granted John the revelation, right? An image of things see for us and for our benefit and uh, to be able to learn and to lean into that a little bit and see what's uh, available for us. So we're going to take bits and pieces, and I don't, that's not always a good way to approach uh, Bible reading is just take a verse or a verse and so forth. But these are separated enough uh, subject wise to where it's safe uh, for us not to take something out of context. So would somebody read uh, for us nice and loud, Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Behold the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. So here's the, here's the key that I want us to understand in this. After the resurrection, believers will not be in heaven. All right? It's, it, don't just take that as oh, we're not going to be in heaven. The idea of us being in it is not the key. The key is heaven will be with us. Okay? And, and so the distinction is here. We are still going to receive God. We don't go to heaven like we arrive at it. So remember we talked about uh, in the first week and we've kind of revisited. Don't think of heaven as a geographical location. Right? It is an existence. It is being in the presence of God. It doesn't matter where it is. When you get up there, and I say up as in we arise, right? It's not even that direction necessarily. That's irrelevant. You're not going to arrive in the presence of God and go, ah, I was really kind of hoping for something else, right? I was hoping it wouldn't take so long or, or, or whatever. None of that is going to be important. The presence of God is what dictates heaven, right? Um, C.S. Lewis had a, a series of books uh, that were about, um, you, some of you guys are going to have to help me out. Uh, it's all the different planets, the, the, the space trilogy or something like that. It talks about a, there's a planet. Okay. If you didn't know this, there's a planet that is Perlandria that the, the fall never happened. And so sin never existed there. And he describes it. And it's just kind of an interesting approach. And we are living on another planet, not called Earth. Um, and, and we're living on this planet. And, it, and it's affected this way. And, and people travel from, from Perlandria to here. And some people think they're angels. Anyhow, this uh, series, it's really fascinating from C.S. Lewis's standpoint of having a place that he said, imagine that heaven was a place. Right? And it really kind of sticks on that. And I don't agree with that because it gets us focused on going to heaven rather than being in heaven. All right, And I don't want to keep harping on this because it's not really a, an issue that the Bible really pounds away. But we often think, all right, when Jesus in Acts ascended and people saw him and he vanished in between the clouds and the angels said, you know, he's going to return. We all kind of go, well, heaven is up. right? And hell then must be down. In fact, we even say that Jesus descended into hell in the in the creeds. And so we think of, you know, proximity to that. And, and yet that's unimportant. It doesn't matter if, if you drill a hole down in the earth's core and keep going, you don't suddenly come to hell. Right. Right. Um, and, and nor do you go up uh, and, and outer, you know, outer space and we travel and suddenly we come to this. Oh, right. And we kind of go, oh, that this must be heaven. This is where I'm going. That's not the issue. The issue is not to be in heaven, but heaven is with us. That's what God says. My dwelling will be with man. And if you think about it, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, that's what God did. Created Eden, came down, hung out with man, right? I mean, can you imagine that? I don't know if you guys had a close relationship with grandparents maybe growing up. And uh, you ever take a walk with a grandparent around their farm or around their hometown and they show you stuff, Right? This is where I proposed to your grandma, you know, and this is this is where I wrecked the tractor in the ditch. And this is you know, that's what I take a walk with my grandparents. And 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 yet you can imagine walking through Eden with God. Right. And you just kind of get to go, God, the, the giraffe. Seriously. Right. Nah, I thought it'd be fun, you know, and uh, come here, come here, taste this. Right. Come here. Look at this. Come here, touch this. Right. And, and that joy of him being with man. 
right? We're going to enjoy that again. That's It, it comes full circle uh, around. Heaven is used in two ways in Scripture, right? It's used in two ways. One is as the dwelling place of God. And we talk about that, right? That God is in heaven. If you talk about the throne room of God, um, the glory of God and things like that, that's referring to heaven. And the Bible refers to that specifically, um, talks about this presence of God. But in the, in the account, I just mentioned Genesis, the heavens are also a way to describe the sky, right? And, and outer space, the things in the heavens, okay? Now, the Bible speaks to those very differently. We've kind of, we've kind of delivered it in English uh, in, in many other languages. We just call them both heaven, right? And, and yet there is a, a, a real distinction to that um, and, and see that distinction as we go through. The Bible doesn't typically speak of life after the resurrection as life in heaven. It just doesn't speak that way. It doesn't, because it doesn't keep, that's something that we have kind of morphed uh, into our understanding of what an existence with God will be. So we say things, oh, grandma went to heaven, kind of like you went to Cleveland. That's a terrible example, right? The armpit of America, right? I can say that because I live there. The point is, is that it doesn't often speak to this idea of a proximity, a geographical location of heaven, all right? Ladies, would you look up Matthew 5, 12, gentlemen, Philippians 3, 20. And when you get it, please read it. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they... They persecuted the before you. So rejoice and be glad your reward is in heaven. So heaven is described in a way that it is about a reward, right? That there's something about that place uh, that's important. Gentlemen, uh, Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So heaven is a place that you will belong. Uh, a citizenship, a, a connection in some way. Um, in your uh, on your papers, Luke six twenty three. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Right. So to echo what Linda read here, the reward is present in heaven. Uh, the reward is present there in Luke. Uh, your treasure, Matthew nineteen. Jesus said, uh, "It would you, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me." And so the idea is that heaven is more of an experience than it is a location, right? I, I think we do a real disservice when we talk about, well, heaven, and I'm going to address this on the back side, um, that heaven will be a place where everything that you love is there. That's kind of idolatry, right? I, re I remember when my dad passed away, somebody came up trying to be comforting, kind of says, I bet your dad's up there fly fishing right now. Beautiful stream. I said, that would be sad. Right? Not that fly fishing is sad. That would be sad that that's what heaven is. What if you don't like fly fishing? Right? What, what, if, what if you don't like, you know, we're going to talk about pets and things like that. What if you're not a big fan of dogs? Right? Um, what, if, what if you don't like lots of sunshine? <laughs> you don't like the thing. Anyhow, we'll get into that. The point is, is that heaven is about an experience, and the experience is being in the presence of God. So in Revelation 21... Jesus is letting them know, right, uh, and John, well, letting us, the church, know through John, he says that, 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 that through heaven that God comes to be with us. The location is irrelevant. And we spend so much time focusing on the location. This is what it will look like. This is what I will look I, I get asked that all the time. What am I going to look like in heaven, right? And, and it's, it's funny why that is such a concern of ours, Right? Is a 16-year-old version of me going to be the one in heaven? I was in much better shape, right? Um, you know, are we going to have clothes in heaven? Am I going to know my spouse in heaven? Are we, uh, you know, are we going to work in heaven? Is there things to do? Uh, is, is there a red box, you know, when things slow down? Um, you know, those kind of things. And, and it's, it's funny how those things are important to us here. I, I, I can almost guarantee you, not because of any experience I've had, but just my own uh, uh, understanding, I think, of, of God's word. The moment you open your eyes the first time in heaven and, and gaze upon God's presence, we're all going to chuckle, I think. And it's going to be a very knowing chuckle to kind of go, <laughs> I, thought, I thought all of that was important. 
right? As I'm here in the presence of God, you're not going to go, well, where's so-and-so? Like you're missing out on something. Or I was kind of expecting something a little hillier, you know? I mean, I'm from Jeff City. It's kind of what I'm comfortable with, right? And, and where's my dog? Right? And, or whatever. And, and somehow that there are things that we think, well, those things have to be in place for us. The moment I think we open our eyes for the first time, it's just going to be wow. And I think we're going to spend eternity wowing. Right? And that's it. All right? We'll talk more about that. Um, creation consists of heaven and earth. Right? Creation consists of heaven and earth. Now, um, let me... Uh, before I, before I leave this, uh, those verses, let me just go back. You guys fill that in. If not, I'll go back to it. As we talk about heaven being a reward and a treasure and things like that, I want you to kind of imagine it this way, because God's often saying uh, a treasure prepared for you, a reward in heaven, an inheritance that's for you. That's being kept safe right now, right? That's what Christ is doing. He's prepared it, and now it's being maintained, in a sense, awaiting our arrival, right? So it is something like, uh, you shouldn't, this is me being judgmental, but I'm right. Um, you shouldn't play the lottery. Okay. You shouldn't play the lottery. It's gambling. It's a waste of money. Okay. Now, but imagine this is wrong to imagine this, but I'm going to use it as an example. Imagine you had a winning lottery ticket, right? hundred million dollars or who cares how much and, and you don't cash it in yet, but it's a winning ticket. That's the promise of heaven, right? Now heaven is not a million dollars. Or $100 million. It's better than that, obviously. But imagine that that is yours. You're, it's just waiting to be collected and experienced. Okay? That's what heaven is. You and I, because of grace, have the winning ticket, so to speak, to inherit the reward that is eternal life, that is no death and suffering and, and all those things, that is waiting for those that put their trust in Jesus. It's yours. In fact, the gift of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in my heart is a, according to, to the Bible, a down payment, a sample of what you and I are going to have. It's yours. Now, if you want to throw it away, you have the right to do that. Prodigal son did that for a time, that I don't want it. And for people to say, I don't want anything to do with God, God goes, okay, I don't want you to, and, and I don't think you understand, but I'm not going to force you, all right? Okay, so... Creation consists of heaven and earth. We know that. Genesis 1 1. Anybody say it for me out loud? In the beginning, God created the heavens. Perfect, right there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we know that that's what we're referring to when we think of creation. Romans 8, let me read this for you. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So it's really kind of a culmination of creation was wrecked by Adam and Eve's disobedience, and it's been wrecked ever since. Now, wrecked, I mean, this is what I'm amazed at. I've shared with you one of the ways I commune with God is in nature. And nature isn't just outside. It's sometimes just marveling at the face of a child and your fingerprints and, and, and people, you know, how they love and show compassion. That's God's creation. If you are ever impressed by God's creation, can you imagine what paradise will be like? Right? You're getting an inkling of it now. There's times uh, when I lived out in, De uh, out in Colorado, my first teaching job was out in Colorado. Uh, and I remember one of the teachers that was, uh, that was out there, been out there for years and years and years. He told me, he said, in Colorado, the Rocky Mountains, beautiful area. He said, if God doesn't live here, this is where he spends his free time. <laughs> right? They had a lot of pride in, in what they thought of Colorado and the beauty of it. And, and if you've ever seen views that are magnificent, mountains, ocean, uh, forests, uh, you know, whatever just is magnificent. Um, you know, you're getting an inkling of, wow, God, and that is broken, right? That is pale in comparison to what paradise will one day be. And he says, that's the reward that's coming for you. It's been uh, corrupted. It's been broken. Uh, and that's what we're uh, attending to now. Because creation has been corrupted by sin, God will one day destroy it. Right? Because it has been corrupted, God is going to destroy heaven and earth. Now, I'm going to talk to you in a second, but I'll tip my hand. He's not talking about heaven where he lives. This is the heaven of the sky and the stars and things like that. We'll get into that. 
So because it's broken, he is going to destroy it. One day, our bodies are going to be transformed. Do you know why? They're sinful. You don't want to be up in the presence of God with a sinful body. Because God doesn't want anything to do with sin. Nothing. Right? So we get glorified bodies. If you are dead, then he resurrects you and you are glorified. If you are still alive when he shows up, you're going to go through quite a transformation. Right? It's, it's going to be more than just the Superman phone booth kind of thing. A phone booth was a box that used to... <laughs> But I teach you sometimes. I'll say something like that, and then I'll just kind of do this. And... Imagine a cell phone on a wire on a box on a street corner. Oh! Yeah. Is it a smartphone? Yeah. It's... Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Ladies, would you look up 2 Peter 3, please? Gentlemen, Psalm 102. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and good works that are done on it will be exposed all right any questions that's pretty clear right you know it said it talks about the word heavens and the earth that now exists are stored up for fire right that one day they're going to be destroyed that's okay right I know a lot of us were kind of like well I've kind of gotten attached to it Right? If you've seen certain things, you're like, I kind of like the mountains and the oceans and things like that. God's not going to do away with those beautiful things. He is going to do away with the broken ones. Right? It, it's, we're, we're, getting, we're trading up for sure. Right? And, and so even though those things, those features are wonderful and magnificent and glory proclaiming, um, he is going to destroy it. And he's going to destroy it simply because it's broken. Okay? All right, uh, gentlemen, Psalm 102, 25 and 26. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing you will change them, and they will be discarded. All right. So, again, this is God's authority, right? His authority over the heavens and the earth, and he demonstrates it not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. So, a couple of key pieces here. Heaven and passing away does not mean the dwelling place of God, obviously. God is not going to destroy his dwelling place. His dwelling place is perfect. There's no reason to do anything with it. Okay, there's no reason to destroy something that is holy and perfect. This is, uh, if I could go all the way back to the very beginning, I was referencing Genesis. Go to Genesis. Don't turn to it, but think back to Genesis 3. When God passes judgment upon sin, it says, Adam and Eve, you got to get out of paradise. Now, that was a punishment, but that's not all it was, right? Getting out of Eden was, Eden is perfect. You're no longer perfect. You can't be here. It was, it was literally, you know, oil and water. You, you cannot coexist. So God and sin cannot coexist. Sin is the opposite of God. So in God's, it, it's, there, this is a very, very deep subject of Christ coming in the flesh, because Christ coming in the flesh was holy, was perfect. He was without sin, and yet he had to be in a human body which was broken, which means it needed to eat, it needed to sleep. If he stubbed his toe, it would hurt, right? Um, and he died, okay? And, and so there's that really fascinating incarnation of Christ that he does in such an intimate and personal way. In fact, we see it in the Lord's Supper, because we talk about it's not just bread and wine. It's not symbolic. He's here. That marriage of holy, divine, and physical and finite come together. The Bible that you have in front of you right now is not only paper and ink and words and language. It is also the very voice of God, divine and physical joined again. This is God doing the incredible what would, what would make most sense with God's identity and the brokenness of creation is that God just separates himself, right? I'm holy. The world is broken. This is the way it's got to be. You just suffer. Instead, he says, I love these people too much. I love my creation too much. So what am I going to do? I'm going to come to them and I'm going to fix it, right? But I'm, I'm going to fix it in this way and that becomes Christ, right? And then even 
on the last day, judgment day, right? That idea of being in the presence of God. Again, he comes to us. Everything about God is him coming to us. None of it is about you going to him. People that say, I found Jesus. I got news for you. He's not missing. Right? He's not lost. He's not going, whoo, thank goodness. <laughs> I was out here walking around. I forgot where I was. Right? Instead, you, you receive, you accept the invitation to be his. You're the one that's lost. I'm the one that's lost. Right? It is not Christ. So again, we, we make these mistakes, and, and I know it's well-meaning. I found Jesus like it was this wonderful thing, and it is wonderful. But if you think that it's you doing the finding, you've diminished what it is that Christ has done. Christ came for 33 years to walk this earth, to, to reiterate and repeat over and over and over again, I love you, I want you, I've saved you, and now I, I want you to be with me. And he said it over and over in so many different ways, demonstrated it uh, and so forth. But that was him coming to us. It wasn't that, you know, if you do this enough, you'll be with me. If you do it good enough, you'll be with me. If you do it consistently enough, you'll be with me. Here's the, here's the end result. There's nothing you can do. I shared with you guys before, right? You're on the sailboat with me and there's waves and storms and things like that. And you wash overboard and, and we throw you a rescue ring with a rope. And if you grab that rescue ring, you're saved. If you refuse it, you die. That's the invitation of Christ. Okay? Now, I know we can fine-tune this so much to say, well, I am grabbing the ring. Don't overthink it. Every metaphor falls apart at some point in time, right? Uh, but the point is, is that Christ is, uh, is a, it, his salvation is an invitation to us. There is nothing that you and I bring to the table. Nothing. That's what makes it grace. Okay? Um, to give you a... a, a perspective on this, um, being in Jeff City, uh, most of you have some kind of exposure to the Catholic Church, right? Maybe you come from a Catholic background, maybe you have friends that are Catholic, uh, and so forth. The, the Catholic Church struggles with that idea of grace. They talk about it, they proclaim it, they celebrate it, but they still talk about you got to do something, right? Pray to the saints to borrow some of their good works. You have to make your sins right in order to receive forgiveness. And, and it's I'll, I'll tell you, it's a very natural move. Everything about our lives is, if I do this, then this is mine. If you go to work, you're supposed to get paid. If you don't get to work, you really shouldn't demand getting paid. Okay. Um, if you speed in your car, you should get a ticket. Okay. If you don't speed, look at people are getting jabbed right now, right? Uh, if you don't speed, you shouldn't get a ticket for speeding, right? That's the that's the the give and take. That's the cause cause and, and reaction and so forth. But that's what's so bizarre and hard to grapple with when it comes to grace. There is nothing that you and I can bring to the table that saves us. Nothing. Nothing at all. It's one of the reasons that as Lutherans, we don't have altar calls. If you've ever heard of an altar call, maybe been to a non-denominational church or Pentecostal church. Um, I've even seen it happen in some um, uh, Baptist non-denominational kind of hybrid church uh, where there's a delivery of a message. If you want to receive Christ, come forward right now. We'll pray the prayer of salvation and you'll be a Christian and a believer today. Right Now, that is not a bad activity if you think that my going forward is receiving that invitation of Christ. The problem is, is it's not a far stretch to say, by my walking forward, I am now saved. You've done something. That's a problem. Right? There is nothing you and I can do to save us. All right? Everybody okay? Nobody's gotten up and left yet? All right. I don't know about you at home. Right? If you have, I hope it was... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, people at home are just getting coffee. That's all right. All right, number two. When heaven and earth pass away, our bodies do not go to the uncreated heaven where he dwells. When heaven and earth pass away, our bodies do not go to the uncreated heaven where he dwells. When I say uncreated, right, where God is, he's always been. Okay, so don't think of heaven as being a place that in Genesis, God had to create a place for himself. Everybody follow? He created a place that was physical, right? Um, I, I always love this. In the beginning, there was nothing. And when I mean nothing, I don't even mean blackness, because blackness is something. That's why I always, I always wrestle with people when they, they tell me that, well, you know, everything began, according to science, with the Big Bang, right? So I always ask the question, what went bang? Where'd the stuff come from that went bang? And so you run into that. 
Okay? And, and so in the beginning, there's got to be nada, nothing. Okay? And that's what Genesis says. In the beginning, there was nothing. If, if you wanted to wrestle with that, you're, the Big Bang doesn't get you to the beginning. You might say, maybe God used the Big Bang. Okay? Well, there's problems with the order of Big Bang and science and so forth. We can talk about that. But the point is, is that in the beginning, there was nothing. God spoke it into being. But since God is eternal, his place, his presence is a given. So heaven has always existed. So when you and I, when the earth, heaven and the earth pass away, that's heaven as far as space and sky and, and everything above the earth and then earth and stuff falls away as well. You and I don't go to be in the throne room of God as our eternal place. It's, it's really got nothing for us there. Okay? To go and, and hang out in the throne room of God where his divine presence is, um, there's nothing for you there. He's not physical. He's, he's not there walking around paradise. Paradise doesn't exist yet. That, that always makes us kind of hurt a little bit. Right? Paradise is going to come at the end. The new heaven and the new earth. We're going to talk about it today. So it's not that you and I are going to be existing after judgment day. That's when the heavens and earth pass away. In heaven, the, the presence of God where he exists currently. He is going to make a place for us. And that place is going to be for us. Where he will come and dwell with us. Notice that he says, I will make my dwelling with people. He doesn't say they're coming to me. I'm going to go and be with people. So there's going to be an existence that God is willing to engage with you and I. And it's going to be a place that is built for us. That's why I'm, I'm fascinated when, uh, when people you know, think that, well, when I die, I become an angel or something like that, that I'm just going to kind of float around in my spirit and so forth. God's given you senses to enjoy him, right? He says that creation is a testimony to my existence. You're going to enjoy that. You and I are going to enjoy God's paradise for all of eternity. I imagine there's going to be smells that you're going to like. There's going to be sights that you're going to like. There's going to be things to touch that you're going to like. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here. Uh, somebody, 2 Peter 3.13, would you please? According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we're waiting for it. It doesn't exist right now. Okay, that's going to come in judgment day. So again... Those that die now, their bodies into the ground or however they uh, breathe their last and their soul goes on, right? And it waits, okay? If it's a believer, it goes on to the presence of God. In his presence, again, in heaven in a way, yes. Um, but don't get hung up on that because we're like, well, what will it be like? What will I do? Um, again, those are... Those are issues, number one, that the Bible doesn't describe in any detail. So therefore, it's not an issue for us. If you go to be in the presence of God, you're going to be really happy about that. But it's not complete. Complete comes on judgment day when the body will be glorified. It will rejoin your soul and you will exist in the perfect presence of God in paradise. So we try not to overuse that word heaven too much because we're not sure, well, what's the context of it? All right. A new heaven and a new earth. So here's what it's described at according to the Bible. I'm going to just touch on these. We could spend a lot of time on each of these, and I, I just have chosen not to, to dive into them too deeply. The holy city Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the holy city Jerusalem, not the current one. The current one is broken. The current one is sinful. In fact, the current one is a real mess, right? Um, there, is, uh, there are so many changes that have happened with uh, the Muslim uh, faith and the Christian faith really uh, colliding there and so forth. God is not going to come down and, and spend his time there. It's broken. It's a mess. And so he's going to destroy it. Everything on earth, everything in the heavens, all destroyed, wiped clean and remade. And so he describes it as a new Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the holy city. Jerusalem was the place in which we would reside with God. And so he calls it the new Jerusalem. Uh, whether it's going to look like an actual city seems to have some of those things uh, shared in the Bible and so forth, but it'll have no temple. Okay, the temple is a location that God chooses to locate himself, not unlike God and Moses with the burning bush uh, or the children of Israel walking through the wilderness with a pillar of fire by night, and a column of smoke by day, that God would locate himself in those ways. When we are in paradise with God, there's no need for him to locate himself. He's there. 
He is, right? And so there doesn't need to be a place that you go, which would then interpret that there are other places that God is not, right? You know, we often think this, this is a mistake when we say on Sunday mornings, where do you go on Sunday mornings? God's house. We go to God's house, right? A lot of people say, where are you going? I'm going to church. Are you church on Monday? You better answer this right. Yeah. Yes, you are. Are you church on Wednesday? Yeah, how about Fridays? Yeah, you really need to be church on Fridays too, right? The point is, is that we are church, not the building. And then many times we say that. So, you know, naturally heaven is that too. You, you go to the temple to worship God. No reason for a temple in heaven. All right, I'm going to rattle your cage with some of this. No longer a need for the word of God in, in paradise. Oh, that bothers me, right? Okay, now tell me what is the purpose of the word of God? <laughs> to get to heaven. That's, that's what it communicates, right? He talks about how we showed up, how sin came, the calling that God has to obey and to follow him and, and to acknowledge that he is king and that he comes in the flesh of Jesus Christ. He teaches that he is God. He saves us through his life, death, and his resurrection. And then he sends us out to go make disciples of all nations. And then he promises us that he's coming back to take us with him. Do you need any of that information in paradise? Not once you're there. Now, that seems really odd for us, but I want you to understand the word of God has a purpose. And the purpose is exactly what David said, is to get us to heaven. That's what it's for. And when you get to the very presence of God, that's what I mean by heaven, right? When you come into the presence of God upon the resurrection of glorified bodies and so forth, there's no reason for the directions anymore. When you arrive someplace where you had your, your uh, my, I do this a lot with my phone, right? I, I put in my address and the GPS, it tells me how to get there. And stuff. Once I get there, it's really not necessary anymore, right? I don't sit there and walk around the house or the place where I am and kind of go, hey, I want you to know this is how I got here. They're like, good, put it away. You're here. It's unnecessary anymore, right? Okay, let me keep going. The Bible tells us there's no sun, no moon, no stars, Okay. That there are changes. Why? The light comes from God. There's no need for a sun. Okay? There's no need. The glory of God is going to be what communicates glory. Right now, the sun is wonderful, but we need the sun right now. I need it for warmth. I need it to grow things. We need it for life here. It designates day and night. Okay? In paradise one day, we're not going to need that. It's just unnecessary. Now, I know, guys, these are those things that you're going to come up to me afterwards and go, Pastor, I know that's what the Bible says, but I don't like that. <laughs> to which I'm going to very lovingly say, read the Bible, right? And, and that's the way it is, right? This is what God is laying out. I, I got to tell you, if I have a choice between living in the glory of God and a burning ball of hydrogen and helium and things like that, I'm going to opt for God, Okay. <laughs> It's not as if I'm going to go, I'm so disappointed there's not a burning ball of gas out here. Okay? I think I'm going to sit there and go, wow, the very perfect presence of God, unobscured by sin and my own flaws and frailty and so forth. That's the perfect presence of God. I like that. The Bible tells us there's never any night. Night is symbolic. Night is darkness. Right? Night is the absence of light. Right? Um, and, and though, even though, right, in our current situation, I think last night, what was the moon last night? What, what was it called? Didn't it have a name? Is it, well, it could be. Anyhow, the point was it was beautiful. It was, it was, but see, it's still meant to be a reflection of light. Obviously, if it's full, you're seeing the full reflection of a, uh, of a satellite around our, uh, our planet, reflecting the sun's light on the other side of the planet. Uh, and we love that. Again, if God is the light, no need for those. Okay. Now, are you going to be disappointed when you get there and go, oh, I love the constellations and I love those kind of things. Come find me. Right. And come tell me how upset you are in paradise that there aren't constellations and sun, moon, stars, and things like that. I don't think you're going to come find me, right? I mean, I do hope you come find me, but I don't think you're going to complain. We will be safe. We will be absolutely safe in the presence of God. Right now, we're not. Right now, there are things that happen because of sin. 
Right now, these bodies are broken. They wear out. Right now, nature is broken, and it wears out. It doesn't function the way it's meant to. There's natural disasters. There's diseases. There's war and pestilence and starvation and all of those things because the world is broken. But paradise one day that is going to be a physical existence of us people is going to be perfect. And so with that, you're absolutely safe. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Uh, there are going to be animals in heaven, in heaven, in paradise, I should say. And in paradise. Now, we're going to talk about that on the backside a little bit of whether or not little Fluffy will be there. Um, I touched on that last week. Uh, Fluffy could be there if he's a dog. <laughs> I'm going to get letters for that one again, too. That's okay. All right. There's also no death. There's no death. Revelation 21, uh, 4. Let me just read this if you're looking up apologies. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Former things have been destroyed. Sin brings all of those things. So all of those things that go away will be present in hell. That existence, crying, pain, misery, sadness, discouragement. Those are all the things that will make hell, hell. And again, we always just kind of, well, there's fire and sulfur and demons and, and the devil and so forth. That's what makes hell so bad. What makes hell so bad is all of the negative things that God is the antithesis to. God is light. Hell is darkness. God is life. Hell is death, an ever-living death, right? Um, heaven is safety, right? Um, hell is fear. Uh, and, and, and chaos and, and agony and all of those things. There's no death. And that includes no illness, no disease. I, I remember when my, uh, when my dad was passing, he, he died of cancer. It was a pretty ugly way to go. Uh, the tumor that was growing in him and just took over his body. And I remember you know, praying specifically, God, if you want to heal him, uh, celebrate that. Absolutely. Um, but if, if not, take him. Now, this is awful. Right, this looks looks painful, and and it's just a terrible thing to have to go through the human body, and uh, and and I was just thinking about that when he did die, and, and my my mom called me. I think it was on Palm Sunday. Uh, I got back from church, and she phone called and said Dad passed, and and uh, it was it was good that one of my younger brothers was with him, and and he passed peacefully, and, uh, and I, I remember being very thankful for that. I, I know people can die in a variety of ways, some just. Some that hurt us more, affect us more. And I remember uh, just saying to myself, you know, my dad, when he opens his eyes again, his body's going to be perfect. No tumor, no cancer, uh, no problems at all. Every single one of us, that's the way it's going to be. When, when you open those eyes and you look with those new eyes, because they're not going to be the old ones. I'm not going to need these anymore. You might not recognize me at first. I'm going to have the little hello my name is, right? <laughs> Maybe it'll be tattooed on all of us, right? Uh, maybe I'll get there with my faith shirt so you'll know. Um, the point is, is, is when we open our eyes for the first time, the bodies are just going to be perfect. There's no illness, no aches and pains, no, no frailty at all. Um, I'm not going to be nearsighted anymore. Um, you know, we're not going to have limps and gimps and pains and, and all of those things. It's just paradise, right? It's perfect. That's his promise. Um, there's even... No fear of animals. Um, ladies, would you look up Isaiah 11, 6 through 9? Uh, and gentlemen, would you look up Genesis 9, 2, please? And ladies, when you get it, please read it. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion, and the fatted, fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder, in the adder's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy house, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the of the Lord as the waters cover over So there's an example of some of what's going to happen in paradise. Look at the interaction. Perfect peace. There's no predators anymore, right? So the, the lion uh, is, is going to be present in paradise. Uh, and you don't have to run up the nearest tree, okay? Uh, because he's going to sneak up and pounce on dandelions. 
Okay, that's going to be a food source. I don't know if Danny Lyons will actually be there. Um, maybe they will be. They just won't be a problem. Okay. Um, the point is, is that animals, there's just going to be perfect harmony, right? The way that God intended it. Gentlemen, Genesis 9, 2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Now, that is, the reason I included that, that's the reason we are the way we are now. That's the reason if you do see a lion, you ought to go up the nearest tree, right? Because there is fear and there is brokenness in creation, right? Uh, not everything works the way it's supposed to now. But one day, all of that brokenness is going to re be repaired, where um, predator and prey here on earth are going to exist together side by side, and there's no fear. There's no worry of death. Uh, there's no carnage, uh, there's no chaos. Everything exists the way that God had it in the very beginning. Um, it boils down to Revelation 21.3. Let me just read this. Um, Revelation 21.3. I don't have it. Somebody have that? And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. All right, so if God is going to be with us, buckle up, folks. This is going to bother you, all right? That means there is no need for communion, there is no need for baptism, and there is no need for absolution. Now, if you've been paying attention and listening to why, that won't upset you too much. If you do come up afterwards and say, I don't like that, <laughs> again, I would ask you, why do we need baptism in heaven? Why would we need communion, right? Right now, that bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, that's there. That's his gift to us. If he's there, do you think you need it? Hmm. What does it grant you? What does communion, baptism, absolution, what does it give you? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. If you're there, do you need it? You got it. You cashed in your ticket. Right? You won. All right? Because of Christ, you won, not you personally. All right? So questions about eternity. Let me just take a couple minutes and uh, hit a couple of these. Uh, these are actually growing out of some of the questions I have uh, of people afterwards or, or uh, through the week. Will there be dogs in heaven? Yes. Will your dog be in heaven? No. Not all of yours. Right? That doesn't make any sense. Right? That we would have several billion canines running around in paradise. Just doesn't make sense. Again, I know what you're saying, but I really love my dog. Okay? Again, we will be happy in heaven. Okay? So if it's not about a pet, what if you had a favorite car? Should that be in paradise? What if you had a motorcycle? No, I think there might be one. Right? It does say that David's victory was heard from miles around. So it's a classic, right? Sorry. That was bad. Right? The point is, is if we think the things that make us happy are going to be in heaven, paradise, then we're missing the point of paradise. That's kind of saying, well, I, I hope there's a swimming pool because I love to swim. I hope there's hiking trails because I love to hike. I hope there's a kayak because I love to kayak. And it's a, Now you're, you're talking about all the things that just make you happy. Those become idols really quickly. Instead, in the presence of God, you are not going to be disappointed. Okay? Secondly, we will recognize, will we recognize our loved ones? Relating to others in this life is important, and I think it's likely to be true in the next. However, right, this is, this is what starts to bother. I'm not going to read that, that Luke 20. It's a little bit longer um, for now, but it talks about that question that Jesus gets about who's married to who when you get to heaven. So what do we do um, if you, uh, uh, your spouse has passed away and you get remarried and so forth and your spouse that passed away is a believer and they're in heaven and the spouse you're married to now, uh, when they pass, they go to heaven and so forth. When you get there, does it make it a little awkward? <laughs> Walking the three of us down the golden path, right? Okay. I like you both the same, right? The point is, is if your love and my love for one another is perfect in heaven, can it be more for our spouse? No, perfect is perfect. So here's the thing, guys. I, I, I love my wife. I'm sorry she's not here to hear that. Right? <laughs> but I do. Right? I love her. And, and so when I get to heaven, my love for her is going to be absolutely perfect. Yours, my love for you all, and I'm assuming you're all going to be there, 
I'm assuming I'm going to be there, right? <laughs> my love for you is also going to be perfect. There's no difference. I, I don't think that I'm not going to know my spouse. I don't think I'm not going to um, appreciate my spouse, but we're not going to pair off with our spouses. You think about that, you're like, so what that means, I love them more than you, so therefore, what is it? It's not perfect, right? My love for you would be marginal, average, but my love for my spouse would be perfect. No, our love for each other is perfect. And, and understand, what was the purpose of marriage, right? Purpose of marriage, be fruitful and reflect Christ in his church. I talk about that all the time, every time we do a, a wedding, right? That the, the, the husband and the wife is meant to be a reflection of Christ in the church. When you get to paradise, do we need to reflect Christ in his church? Paradise is Christ and his church, right? So marriage isn't necessary. Are you going to be fruitful and multiply in heaven? No, no, that's done. That, that need is. So the purpose of marriage has changed. In fact, it's all but been eliminated. Now, the love for your spouse, the love for the people around you is perfect. So please don't be disappointed in that. Please don't think that, well, I want to love my spouse more. Well, that makes me feel bad, right? Instead, we're going to love each other perfectly. And lastly, and I'll finish with this because we're out of time. Uh, will we see those suffering in hell? I'm going to read this uh, because I want you to hear this. Isaiah 66, for as the new heaven and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be abhorrence to all flesh. And then Revelation 14, it says, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented in the fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image in whoever receives the mark of its name. Now here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. It appears that you and I are going to be mindful of those that are suffering in hell. And, and as a constant reminder of the goodness of God, um, we're not going to watch it in a morbid sense. I think it is simply a reminder of this is what God has provided and protected us from. Right now, you and I look at things like that through sinful eyes and say, I would be depressed. I would be sad. Our knowledge in heaven is going to be perfect. We're going to understand. Just like you and I understand when a child makes a mistake and we go, I understand they're going to make mistakes. I don't lose my mind and, and, and lament that. I just sit there and go, no, I understand. Children will make mistakes. I understand it. Right? And in heaven, I think we're going to have that same recollection. So if we will, it sends cells as a reminder. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you for the promise uh, of heaven and paradise with you one day. Lord, may we be mindful of what does your word tell us? What did you, Jesus, teach us? Uh, as you walk this earth and so forth. And let us hang on to that and be mindful of the times when our own bias, our own preference, our own traditions and practices, uh, Lord, distract us from what is true. Uh, Lord God, I pray for each member here, every member watching uh, online right now, that, Lord, we would seek and lean in so that we will be with you in paradise one day. God, thank you for giving us hope and life and promise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.